Hello and welcome back to this damn full idealistic crusade. This is the next in my seemingly never ending series of Laserdisc collection updates. These are all titles I've picked up for well, pretty much the rest of the year for 2023 from local stores, which have had more various lots come through, and also some titles I received from fellow members of the Laserdisc Wolfpack group, which of course is over on uh, the Culture Dog channel. So to start, I'll go into the various box sets. So I think I'll start and end this video with some real notable rarities. So in terms of box sets, this first one, which was nicely sent to me by Luke from the Wolf Pack, is a Japanese exclusive I've always wanted to try, and it is a 1998 box that is very uncommon, and that is the box set pressing of the two iconic Flint films, Armand Flint and In Like Flint, with beautiful original artwork on this box, and of course, just remove the Obi strip to see it in all of its lovely glory. Uh, this, of course, was the final and technically best laser disc pressing of the two films, which only got a standard Fox widescreen disc in the early 90s here, and those LDs are pretty Pretty solid with nice sounding mono tracks so I'm very curious to check out the box set version which I'm presuming given that this is 98 is probably the the master that turned up on DVD here and so this being at the end of the format uh, Fox just decided to skip uh, the Flint films getting a spiffed up laser disc release and of course the resurgence of interest in the Flint films really came due to the first Austin Powers movie and then I believe it's Spy Who Shagged Me that actually name checks in like Flint as the favorite movie of Austin Powers. But if you open this box, it's just a lift top box. Inside is just the two individual jackets for each film. So it's probably didn't necessarily need to be a box set, but it's still a cool box set nonetheless. There's also this insert uh, that I'm, I'm not exactly sure about. Uh, it's got a stereo to mono indicator. So I don't know if that's encouraging people to take the 2.0 PCM tracks and try to force single channel mono by applying ProLogic or what exactly this is, but um, this is the only printed material that's inside the box. Actually, double checking the jackets, that indicator about stereo and mono is, I guess, to do with the first film because the first film is listed as having a stereo track on here, uh, but these films were both mono films and In Like Flint has mono on the jacket. So I'm not sure if this is maybe a, a sort of attempt at a fake stereo, which Fox did a lot during the DVD era, but um, or if it's just listed that way and trying to encourage people to try and use some sort of stereo processing, I'm not entirely sure. So I'll have to throw this on and check it. But that's what that paper insert seems to be referring to. The actual jackets beautifully use the original iconic beyond striking poster artwork for each film. The, each film is just a single CLV disc with PCM audio. I had always thought these were supposed to be the original mono mixes, like the first Fox LDs, and that these would just be uh, slightly spiffed up picture masters and, of course, being pressed at the end of the LD era. So as far as I can tell, the real main difference, of course, is the lovely jacket printing. And, of course, these are Japan exclusives being pressed in 1998 versus the old uh, early widescreen Fox US LDs. But, again, we get the lovely original imagery, nice color, a nicer premium jacket, and, of course, done in the style of most Japanese releases. So uh, the artwork is top-notch on this. And, of course, far beyond the standard Fox widescreen disc we got here. Here, of course, is In Like Flint, again, with the iconic Bob Peak poster artwork, beautifully reproduced on the jacket uh, it's a nice japanese printing so it's got a nice sort of matte finish to it it's got the thicker card stock so it feels really nice in the hand and we have lovely images on the back with of course japanese text this one is actually credited as mono so it doesn't seem to have the same processing applied to it as the first film but again both of these should be in terms of the transfer basically the laser discs of what we eventually got on the DVDs, and so Japan got this nice box set. Meanwhile, uh, we had to wait until those DVDs to actually get another release of these films. So there doesn't seem to be any extras outside of perhaps the actual trailers as well, but the real draw to this, of course, is the nice custom box. Again, here is the rear, so you can essentially imagine that had Fox decided to stick with LD a little bit longer, they might have put out more catalog titles like they planned to, which these seem to have been uh, spiffed up for just a U.S. release we didn't get and that we, that we eventually got on the DVDs. 
it's really nice to have this beautiful box. These films are burned in my brain simply from how many times I watched them growing up and continue to watch and adore them. And they really represent the pinnacle of what other studios did during the 60s spy craze. Now, it's not often that I stumble across the nice MGM UA actor or actress specific box sets in the wild. And especially uh, because they're usually stuffed with discs. Uh, when you do find them, they're really beat up. And the covers with the really nice tinted image, you know, you, you, basically you want to find one of these boxes not destroyed so uh, it was very surprising to find a couple in local stores for dirt cheap so i couldn't resist the betty davis box which i've seen before but it's usually beat to crap and this is quite hefty because like a lot of these you've got multiple films in here so this brings together the old maid the letter uh, in this our life which was directed by john houston uh, of course the classic now voyager and a stolen life all of these with newer masters all with pcm mono and done in the same style as these other uh, mgm boxes but this not only has an insert this actually has an essay about Betty Davis written by Roddy McDowell. So it has that nice personal touch to it. And it's just a really beautiful little note from McDowell who talks about Davis on the first part of this insert. Then we open it to get more gorgeous imagery and then the chapter listings for each film. Now, the only extras here, of course, they do include trailers at the end for each film that they had them. But nicely, We've got five films here that each get their own individual discs. It used to be pretty common for box sets where one film would run into the other, but this is one of those boxes where they nicely split each film onto an individual disc. So that means this is a pretty hefty box because you've got five films, so five discs and ten sides. So that's why whenever you find this, it's usually got the shot corners and the discs are flopping everywhere and it's much heavier. So for these particular films, this is just about the best you can do on the Laserdisc format. And some of them remained box set exclusive for, for this box in terms of actually having uh, a nicer transfer and digital audio. I also found a mint copy of the Gable and Crawford box set with this gorgeous cover. All, all of these boxes look really fantastic. It's such a simple thing, a, a, a tinted uh, old studio still, but it's really effective. And once again, you've got a lot of films in here. This is quite hefty because this one has six films. It's still just five discs, but it's six films, five discs, ten sides. And once again, you have an absolutely gorgeous insert complete with essay and write-up and more full-page imagery. Of course, we have our chapter stops and our chapter listings for the 10 sides, and they do include trailers where they survived and then the credits on the back. So this follows the same overall design as the Davis box, but uh, we don't get the personal essay. And also there's another film here. So you've got more films to cram into the chapter listing. So obviously the, the booklet placements are a little bit different. Of course, all of these do have PCM digital mono and are much spiffier than previous video releases of, of the films that actually had gotten video releases. Uh, this remains the, the best release of these films on the format. And for the films that have not gotten a revisit from, say, the Warner Archive on Blu-ray, such as Possessed, uh, a lot of these films are still in these masters if, if they've not gotten revisited uh, by the Warner Archive. So a lot of those uh, archive MOD discs, when they have to use an old master, it's pulling from the Laserdisc master. So the MGM transfers at this time, they could be really good in terms of quality, or um, they could just be having to use a, a lesser source. And then if there's a later DVD or Blu-ray, that's usually going to have a, a, a better source that's being used to begin with. So these box sets can be kind of hit or miss in terms of the, the sources they were having to use, but still it is the best and spiffiest presentation for a lot of these films on the format. And you get nice digital audio for all of them in these wonderful box packages. But again, you want to find these in good shape, not dinged up, because they are quite hefty. And usually when you see these, they're beat to crap. And the discs are going everywhere because the box is long since uh, deteriorated or torn up. Now, this next one is definitely the rarest of these MGM box sets I'm discussing. And it's very uncommon, uh, but it's also, you know, it's really the best Laserdisc presentation of the jazz singer. And also it features in a lot of other films that, of course, have... Very much non-PC material, but also 
should be looked at for their historical importance, and they don't necessarily have a lot of releases outside of this. I think the Warner Archive has released some, if not most, of these as MOD DVDs, but I'm not 100% sure. But it, I just never expected to stumble across the L. Jolson collection box set. This is a very thick, heavy box set. As you can see, they use one of the key images from the Jazz Singer, and this is an eight film box set. So the box is so thick that the actual top does not really fully fit on. So that's why the, the pink uh, bottom part of the box is actually kind of sticking out because they literally crammed this full and the box is in perfect shape. So that's why I was really surprised to stumble across this. I've always meant to see more of the Jolson films outside of The Jazz Singer. I've just never really had the opportunity to. And I figured this would be the way to do it since this box set is also, again, very, very uncommon. I'm pretty sure they probably printed a very limited uh, number of these boxes back in the day. Uh, like the other boxes, all of these have PCM digital sound. And if any had a release before this, this is definitely going to be the spiffiest version and again the jazz singer being in here this is basically the best laser disc presentation of the film that is generally regarded as the breakthrough sound feature so that is of course important to have this box set for if you want the jazz singer on the best laser disc presentation this was definitely one of the bigger more deluxe mgm boxes trying to dig into film history because we got one of their lovely dedicated booklets loaded with images, but primarily devoted to just the sheer amount of chapter stops that have to be covered because there are 13 sides of material here. That's why the box set is so stuffed. But each film gets its own little write-up and gets imagery and gets a nice amount of chapter stops. And then all of the trailers that survive are uh, saved for the end, which is side 13, which is CAV. And if that was not enough, they actually include the classic I Love to Sing a cartoon, which is part of the the Looney Tunes boxes, but uh, it's nice to have here because that song is directly tied to these, and also that song is so beautifully whimsical, and you see that cartoon, and it gets stuck in your head for the rest of your life. But it's nice to see them uh, tack that on here as part of the supplements, and that's, of course, the same sort of practice they've done with various Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies cartoons from this point all the way through DVD and Blu-ray, and now even on UHDs as well sometimes. So um, that's basically where this sort of practice started. And then the rear has more imagery and nice write-ups. So this is obviously material that is not politically correct and obviously needs to be looked at for the context in which it was made and the time period in which it was made. But it is commendable that MGM UA put together this whole gigantic box set of these films uh, at this point in time and gave them a deluxe Laserdisc treatment. This is definitely one of their uh, film collector geared box sets like the MGM Shorts uh, volume box sets they did. So that's why I was very surprised to just stumble across this. This is definitely not a box I've ever seen in person before. And as you can see, it is absolutely stuffed it's so stuffed the actual lid does not want to stay on so this is one of the most impressive uh, of the MGM UA uh, essentially film history boxes they were doing which you know not not many companies and studios were doing this at the time so this is extremely commendable for for them to do this at this point in 92 93 I also found a copy of the Roan box of the Karloff Lugosi collection with the beautiful uh, purple background artwork and of course this brings together some of their Poverty Row films which have seen nothing but horrible video releases over the years but this was really one of the only good versions you could have of some of these films in terms of something that was an actual print scan where somebody tried to do a good scan and get a better print so for these films at this time this was the best you could do and the first release that didn't look and sound like utter crap and for some of these, since other later versions are either not so good or there's just other public domain crappy versions or the, the better later versions are out of print, this is still a, a solid option. But basically for any Poverty Row film, if you missed out on a Blu-ray release or there isn't, a modern HD scan or something. Sometimes you have to go back to, say, an old Roan Group DVD. A lot of those reports of their Laserdiscs, and sometimes you have to actually go back to the Laserdiscs. So these can be important and be good options. So this brings together British Intelligence, Mr. Wong Detective, which is one of the uh, Karloff-starring Mr. Wong films, 
Invisible Ghost with Lugosi, Ghost on the Loose, and the best Lugosi Poverty Row film, I think, The Devil Bat. Now, some of these have gotten modern HD scans. The Invisible Ghost had a Kino release that I missed out on, so that's now quite expensive because it's out of print. That's why I decided to pick up this box. Uh, the Devil Bat has a beautiful Preservation Master on the Kino release, which I have reviewed and is a must. Uh, and Kino has actually released the uh, Karloff Mr. Wong films, uh, which I do want to pick up, but it's a little pricey, but I still would like to pick that up because I've always wondered if those films would ever get a new scan. But again, this is a nice package. It's a Rome group release, so it has a lovely essay. It has a nice amount of chapters. All of these have digital sound. And of course, we're actually, you know, just about the first solid versions of these films you could actually get on home video. We even have the Rome group audience survey card, which is very, very nostalgic. And of course, it always throws me that the Rome group themselves are actually based in Georgia because it's Rome group. They actually made this nice little custom label for each side. So that's another nice touch and something that makes Rome discs a bit unique. So again, I just picked this up because it's a Rome title. The box was in really nice shape. It was super cheap. And I just wanted to see the, the other films I didn't have a good copy of. And I missed out on Invisible Ghost on that Kino Blu-ray. So this is really just about the only other good option for that film. And uh, some of these films don't have new scans and Blu-rays. So and it's a it's a lovely Rhone box, and I'm a Karloff and Lugosi geek, so what's not to love? And then I also picked up the Universal May West box set, which is quite uncommon. This was done later in the 90s and is similar to the box sets Universal did for the uh, classic horror uh, Mummy and Invisible Man sequels, for example. Uh, the first most iconic films got early encore discs, never got a fancy or laser disc reissue, but the sequels were done later, got a box set just like this in terms of the design, and they also got digital soundtracks. So this is four of the later Mae West films with a rather nice looking cover art design and of course just appropriating the VHS artwork that had been generated. We have a hinge box design. So this is all attached here. So it literally opens on a hinge. And then we have the same design motif on the back with the credits for each film. And again, noting that they do have PCM mono audio on this release. So of course, the box opens on the hinge, which is still attached. So this is just like the uh, Mummy and Invisible Man boxes. And just like those, we get a nice custom booklet with the same artwork. We get new essay text and the chapter listings for each film. The films are spread over six sides, and then three of the films include the trailer, and we have all of those included as a, a trailer gallery at the end of side six, and then just the plain image for the back. So this is a, a, a nice box. I must admit the reason why I picked this up was because it was cheap, and it's a cheap laser disc that's quite uncommon of a classic title, and... I'm weak when it comes to cheap discs, I guess. But also, it's a very uncommon box, and I was curious to see how this would compare to the more recent restorations, especially in terms of the audio that uh, popped up on the must-own beautiful indicator box set. So um, this was really more of just a, a curiosity pickup, and because it's so uncommon, it was in perfect shape, and again, only a couple dollars. So... I can't resist cheap discs. Next, I'll go over some titles from various Wolfpack members. These I got from Marcus, who found some really cool discs uh, for super cheap at, at one of the stores he was at. So uh, he basically asked if anybody needed anything. So he hooked me up with a beautiful condition copy of the letterbox pressing of War Games, which is not super common. It's a later MGM pressing from 1994. Uh, it has the original Dolby Stereo mix on the digital tracks and looks quite nice for, for the jacket. So I'm looking forward to firing this up. This is just a pressing that's always eluded me. And uh, it seems similar in design in terms of the jacket and the layout to uh, their Poltergeist jackets. So I, I guess that's just what they were going for with the black background. But it's a really nice looking jacket with original imagery and everything. And I think easily the best looking War Games uh, cover for physical media. He also found me some Criterion titles. This is a really nice, still mostly sealed copy of Spine 21, which is Mr. Hewlett's Holiday. And as you can see, we even have the Criterion Special Edition sticker and the original Laser Blazer sticker, which is awesome to see. Of course, the shrink is mostly torn off, but I, I just thought that was really fantastic to see. This is a CAV release, but it uh, doesn't list that it has digital audio. So here it is without the shrink and really beautiful shape. Of course, the rear. This seems to just be the full CAV presentation, but without any supplements. 
and then we have this lovely gatefold of images because this is the full CAV version. Then we have Spine 47, which is the movie-only release of the classic Adam's Rib, which, even though it's the simple Criterion jacket style, it does look really nice with the white background. And there is a slight gloss on the actual jacket, which is nice, but we get the Criterion write-up. Uh, some of these were just so absurdly cheap, I, I couldn't say no when, when he said how cheap they were at this store he was at. So I'm just inching my way closer to Criterion completion. This next one is an upgrade copy for me. It's the Spine 153 of Breathless with the beautiful jacket. I just love how they laid this out and the, the black and white and the actual font they used just... It makes me think of a Beatles release, actually. That's what it, it just looks like to me. And I just like the idea of, of Breathless being mixed with Beatles imagery for some reason. Um, but the version I have of this has, has a jacket with a bunch of stickers and all kinds of wear and stuff. So this is just an upgrade for the jacket. Uh, this is a, a nicer presentation, the best version on US LDs, and it does have a PCM mono track as well. But it doesn't really have supplements outside of the, the new transfer and uh, digital audio. Next is Spine 187, which is the Truffaut film Confidentially Yours with this lovely, gorgeous art. As you can see, this is, of course, a later Criterion title because of the modern banner on the top. You have a nice looking rear. Uh, no real extras. The the draw here is, of course, is that it's the best laser presentation. It's a new master, new subtitle translation, and we have digital audio of the original track and then the backup analog track. And the audio had new restoration work done. So this is just the spiffier criterion presentation. Then a last is Spine 236, which is Truffaut's The Woman Next Door. Again, really nice art and very much like what you see on a lot of later Criterion releases of this era. Spiffier rear cover with an Andrew Saris essay. And the real draw here is, of course, getting the newer transfer, newer audio transfer, newer subtitles, and this does have digital audio as well. So, of course, this is the best release on the format. So thanks to Marcus for those. And next, I'll go over the local criterions I picked up. Uh, the first is a Voyager title, which is the release of Salt of the Earth. And, of course, Voyager is so criterion adjacent that they're basically criterion releases in everything except name. And this is always a, a film I've wanted to see because it's tied to a lot of... Of people who are unfortunately blacklisted and the cover art is quite striking so on the rear it looks similar but different to a traditional criterion release and of course this film is also very important for its political message and its historical background its production background and it's just one i've always meant to see so i figured i'd try it on the voyager release and i do believe that this is analog audio only because it's 87 and there's no indication anywhere so i just think this is analog only but still you don't expect to find voyager releases in the wild you know still in the shrink wrap and in nice shape i found spine number 93 which is the criterion release of annie hall this is a standard clv release and they never did anything besides this one particular release uh the artwork is just a a random still but you know it it, it works and it kind of grows on you um i have the mgm letterbox pressing which i'm sure is probably using the same master and that laser disc has the best audio of the film i know of so i've always wanted to check it against the criterion which also has a digital mono track and has the nice criterion essay and style but obviously no extras this is just a film only disc but again i just wanted to check it for the audio at some point and i found this for about a dollar so dollar criterions are a thing and i can't say no I'm inching closer to Truffaut completion because I found Spine 158, which is the deluxe presentation of The Last Metro with this lovely unique artwork. That's a really nice jacket for Criterion at the time. Of course, we get the custom rear, but as it's a longer film, we get a full gatefold with additional portions of the essay and more lovely imagery. So it's a nice gatefold presentation as well. Then the rear has the rest of the essay and of course, the special features are that this is a new transfer, new subtitle translation, and it does include the trailer. So really, the trailer is the one extra. The supplements and the, the special part of this is, once again, it's a new transfer and new subtitles. Uh, we have plenty of chapter stops. We do get the original trailer at the end of Site 3. And of course, the mono itself is in digital PCM. But this is just one of the spiffier Criterion releases I've wanted to pick up, simply because I'm a Truffaut fan and and this artwork is really nice looking. And then rather surprisingly, I found a 
rather nice condition, inexpensive copy of Spine 334, which is the Criterion box set of The Rock, their big deluxe special edition that, of course, they would eventually do a, a DVD of. But this is really impressive, very uncommon, and usually goes for quite a bit. So I was very surprised to find a pretty good condition copy. This is the only one I've ever seen in the wild, so that was surprising. Of course, the actual box has a sort of matte finish on the top. The title has a little bit of embossing on the printing, as does Alcatraz itself, so that's the effect they went for here, and it's really impressive, but uh, it means the box is more impressive in person than when you just see a random photo of it. Of course, we have the custom spine. And we have the rear with the list of the supplements. And this, of course, has a Dolby Digital AC3 5.1 and Dolby Surround on the digital tracks. But, of course, there was also the standard release pressing from, that's you know basically a Disney disc. And then eventually there was also a DTS pressing. So the DTS version will be the one you want for the best sound overall on the format. But the Criterion version is ahead in all other areas. And the AC3 is no slouch. It is a hinge attack. Uh, box design. We get a nice thick cardstock booklet with the essay and write-up materials and of course the chapter stops and production credits. The film is presented in full CAV here and runs five sides and side five concludes with the start of the supplements which are quite extensive. Uh, most of the stuff did make it over to later releases but not everything. So we have everything from the trailer to TV spots, production design images, storyboards, publicity stills. Uh, we have various outtakes, we have vintage uh, promotional video materials, we have effects sequence breakdowns, and even a brief history of Alcatraz and other various commercials, and then of course the LD production credits. All of this is listed here, which also lists the fact that the audio tracks also include the commentary specifically made for the Criterion release that is here on Analog Track 1, so this is an absolutely stuffed LD presentation and again there are some elements that did not make it over to Criterion's DVD and some elements that have not made it to any other release. And if that was not enough we even got custom labels for each of the discs which is a, always a nice touch. So this was a real surprise to stumble across in the wild for less than ten dollars so again cheap criterions are out there they do pop up if you're patient and every once in a while you might find a box set copy of the rock next i'll go over the other discs i got from luke and to start uh, this is a super late release and one of the films i try to champion wherever possible that is the 1936 masterpiece the walking dead which is a boris karloff vehicle directed by michael curtis and basically fuses a horror film into a classic warner gangster film and yet it manages to attain a, a particular eeriness and a sense of the spiritual side of things, which it really makes it incredibly striking. And, you know, probably the best film Karloff made outside of his iconic Universal films and his Val Luton films, and one of the best horror films of the 1930s, and just plain one of the best films of the 30s. It's an absolute masterpiece, and it's amazing. It got a nice late-release laser disc pressing with a spiffed-up transfer, nice artwork. Again, this is a super late release. It's a 1999 release. It is very uncommon, and I didn't even know this had gotten a Laserdisc release like this for the longest time because it is such a late, uncommon disc. Uh, there are no extras, but again, this is a newer transfer with digital PCM mono audio, and it's probably the same transfer that was then used uh, years later for DVD on the uh, Karloff and Lugosi Warner DVD set that did add a great Greg Mank commentary for this film. So... Uh, if you can't find the Laserdisc, definitely pick up that DVD. This is one of the titles I keep hoping Warner Archive uh, does a Blu-ray of from a new scan because this film really deserves it. This is a true masterpiece. If you've never seen it, please go seek it out. And I'm just really excited to finally have the Laserdisc version. He also nicely sent me the Japanese pressing of How Green Was My Valley. So this will go on my John Ford shelf. It's got this lovely uh, presentation style with the sort of silvery uh, I guess prestige uh, looking frame and of course the obi strip slides off to show the whole jacket it keeps this motif then the rear continues this 
This is a nice jacket, much thicker cardstock, of course, because it's Japanese. And this does have digital audio, so it's the original mono as PCM. So this is a much fancier jacket than the standard US disc. And I'm looking forward to comparing this to other versions and looking at the digital audio track, which not all Japanese releases at this time had. So it's nice to see a classic title get a Japanese pressing with a nice cover artwork and digital audio as well. He also sent me the harder to find uh, remastered widescreen version of Strategic Air Command, which is one one of the Anthony Mann directed Jimmy Stewart starring films as part of their partnership. This is probably the, I mean, it's basically kind of in ways a glorified Air Force commercial. <laughs> uh, so it's probably on a story level, the probably the weakest film of their uh, incredible collaboration. But even films like this that ostensibly wouldn't necessarily add up to much have such incredible nuances because it's one of the greatest director and actor partnerships in all of film history. And now I can look at it on the widescreen remastered Laserdisc here from Paramount. Uh, this does have digital audio and was a pioneer pressing, but it's just film only, but finally getting a newer transfer in widescreen. And that's important because this was a VistaVision title. So of course, uh, the image will be, even on Laserdisc, will be obviously greatly superior to standard films of the same time period. And the audio can sometimes be stereo or something other than mono, but I think this is still just mono. He also sent me the Japanese pressing of Marooned with the incredible original poster artwork. It looks fantastic on this jacket. And of course we have the black obi strip. There's a rather nice gatefold as well. And then the rear is really striking. This has a stereo mix on here, but this being an older Japanese disc, it's unfortunately just analog stereo and it's a pan and scan presentation. In spite of all that, it's still a beautiful looking jacket with really bold color usage. So this is just a really cool Japanese pressing in terms of they, they really went all out on most of their releases for making the art as bold as possible. Similarly, he also sent me the 1982 Japanese pressing of Eye of the needle complete with the silver obi strip as a traditional warner home video jacket um, obviously this is in the same style as other warner discs and obviously not the original aspect ratio and analog audio only but still this is a really nice looking jacket with a version of the original poster art and it looks quite good on the the traditional warner japanese jacket well, this is in really nice shape. I really do enjoy this film. I think it's quite underrated. And of course, it was this film that got Richard Marquand selected to direct Return of the Jedi. So it's important for Star Wars fans as well. But it's one of the great World War II set thrillers of the past couple decades it is still it still holds up really well and is very much underrated and then really cool because he knows i'm a giant lifelong rem fan he sent me the japanese pressing of the parallel videos collection this is primarily videos from the monster era and while we did get LD releases of the REM video collections, they're not super common. And even their DVD ports, which had PCM stereo, those aren't super common either. So uh, Monster being one of my favorite records ever, I've always wanted to get the parallel collection on LD. And this is just a really cool way to do it. And of course, being Japanese, it's got the thicker card stock and the color printing is nice and saturated for this really striking cover. So super excited to finally have the parallel collection on LD. So thanks to Luke for those. And next I'll go over some discs I picked up from Vinny, also from the Wolf Pack. Uh, this one I've always been curious about and because it's an iconic horror film and there's not a lot of pressings and this is the fanciest one. It's usually a bit pricey, but he had a nice minty copy of the widescreen pressing of The Omen with beautiful original artwork. This is a really nice looking fox jacket and it's got a nice bit of gloss on the jacket too. So this looks really nice and it's a later fox disc because it has the fox logo on the bottom and the rear is also spiffed up some with nice imagery and of course much beyond your traditional old school fox gray generic background importantly this does have the film's original mono mix which a lot of releases did start dropping in favor of remixes and things so i've been curious to check this out for the audio track so i'm going to compare this to the uh, shout factory blu-ray of the 4k master but unfortunately there's no extras so essentially this was just getting the film finally in widescreen with a nice jacket, original poster artwork, and PCM mono. Similarly, he had another disc I've always meant to check for the audio and to look at the transfer. That's the standard release of The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. This is the Paramount disc from the 80s. It never got a widescreen presentation until DVD, and this is analog audio only. So it's gonna be the original mono as analog, 
but as I've been looking at other versions, trying to find a better version of its audio, as the UHD has issues of its own and does not have a version of the original mono, um, I've had to be looking at a lot of different old VHS tape releases, and so I've always meant to check out the LD, and of course, Years ago, I didn't think it would be important, and it's not widescreen, and it didn't have digital sound, so I passed up when they're cheap copies. Uh, so it was uh, nice to see this pop up when Vinny had a copy, so he nicely sold this to me for super, super cheap. So I just picked this up because it's in perfect shape, and I've wanted to check out the transfer and the audio. So again, this is a 133 presentation, which... It's not so bad because this is a VistaVision film, and so as opposed to it being pan and scan, but it's still not how you're really supposed to see this film. But I'm just curious about the transfer, and I really want to check the analog mono on here. Another one I've always wanted to check the transfer and audio for, he had a nice condition copy of the CLV DiscoVision pressing of Psycho. Now, I have read over the years that this is supposed to have a unique transfer and a unique audio source that was used, but of course, it's hard to find DiscoVision that's not totally rotted, and find disco vision in good shape let alone uh you know the jacket not being destroyed so he had this really nice copy and while i would have preferred to have had the cav uh, i've never gotten to check this in any way shape or form and this is the clv and it's in really nice shape and the jacket is one of the best looking jackets for a disco vision in terms of condition i've seen because again most disco vision copies are totally shot and of course, the discs themselves are usually Rot City, so um, I'm just curious to finally be able to check out the transfer, and especially the analog audio, which again, I've read is supposed to be from a lower generation source, so I've just been curious about that ever since I read that on the DiscoVision website years and years ago. I think that was an old Discord posting, actually. So hopefully I'll finally be able to, to check this out and, and hopefully not run into any Rot issues, but of course, those can pop up on any DiscoVision title, but I've just always been curious about this transfer and again this is just such a nice looking clv copy that was super cheap and so i figured might as well finally try this as well so thanks to Vinny for those now i'll move on to some discs i picked up from the broterian master himself ryan cushing and again it's another hitchcock title i picked up just because the audio this is another of these rare variant japanese pressings where later on they did a few random ones that added digital sound so this is the release of Frenzy in the Hitchcock Collection style. But as you can see, it's got the 90s Universal logo in the corner. And that means this pressing is from 1994, which of course means that this actually has digital PCM mono. So that's why I wanted to check this out. Anytime I can find one of these, I, I definitely pounce on it because... I didn't know these existed for the longest time until I found Vertigo by accident. And for some of these films, this is quite possibly the best audio presentation there is because outside of this, there are some Hitchcock films that have had so much noise reduction and things over the years that the old tapes and laser discs uh, in the U.S. can be the best sources. And so finding a PCM version of that audio on a rare Japanese variant pressing is sometimes the best source you have for trying to save some of these audio tracks. That's how it is on some of the classic universal horror films, for example. So that's what sort of clued me in to finally realizing, hey, there's Hitchcock titles with Japanese digital audio pressing. So this is just another one I've been able to finally find and hopefully chip away at the rest. Once again, another disc to check for audio, something that I never thought I would need to, but this is actually not an easy disc to find complete in good shape, and I've never checked this. That is the original Fox pressing of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly from 20th Century Fox Video with the international cut, pan and scanned, but with analog mono, and a nice section of the original U.S. artwork, so it's a nice-looking jacket. And because this doesn't have a gatefold, this is a better condition jacket because there's only some spine wear, but there's no seam splitting, thankfully, which is really nice because you can feel how heavy the discs are in here, and this is quite thin cardstock. But it's maintained this glossy finish really well, so this is a actually quite a nice jacket for the time. We get the traditional Fox, or CBS Fox as it would be later, uh, design for the jacket. We have the UA logos. But again, I just picked this up just to look at the transfer, see what source they used, and check out the mono track. Next is the Roan Group release. 
the double feature of Angel on my shoulder with Svengali. Uh, this was actually still sealed, so I just took the shrink wrap off. This is a nice roan jacket, has a nice uh, glossy finish on here. We do have the traditional roan right up for each film. And we have the substantial roan write up information printed in the gatefold, which also has this thick gloss finish. So, this is a super impressive jacket printing. This was a new transfer for each of the films, which have not had a good transfer history. As far as I know, I think this is still just about the best version of Svengali that's out there. And Angel on My Shoulder has been cursed with tons of public domain releases and then finally got a newer disc, but I don't think that version is particularly good either. So I figured I would pick this up, especially since it was in perfect shape. And it does have digital audio for both films, plus the lovely roan materials in terms of the write-up and things and the more time that goes by the more impressed i am with roan discs so this is one closer to being roan group complete this next one i picked up because uh ryan was having a whatnot sale and you know this was absurdly cheap and i don't have all three of the faces so I picked up the Faces edition of Star Wars. So this, of course, is the CLV repressing of the Definitive Master with the Definitive Dolby Surround Remix as PCM with the iconic Faces artwork, as we like to call it. There's a nice gloss finish on this. We have the rear that is used on all the Faces discs. And, of course, we have a nice gatefold as well. I've had the Faces of Jedi for, for years and years, and I have the Definitive box, so I don't technically need these, although it is thought that the Faces discs are super NTSC pressing, so they do have that potential advantage over the Definitive box. Also, the Faces versions don't suffer laser rot like the Definitive box does, and Empire Strikes Back doesn't have the issue of the first pressing of the box losing the scene of Leia welding on the Falcon. So I just picked this up because it was in perfect shape and super super cheap and one of Ryan's whatnot sales, which I highly encourage you to check out. His handle on there is, of course, Broterian. What else would it be? Um, so I just picked this up because I just have the Faces of Jedi. So someday I, I guess I'll get a, a copy of the Faces Empire, just have all three, because I do have great fondness for, for the Faces style artwork, and I still have my old VHS tapes as well. So I just figured I'd finally get one of the other LDs. He also had a copy of the Mystery Disc, Murder Anyone. This is the interactive murder mystery laser disc game that you play along with and interact with the entire cast of characters in the style of Clue. There was a Clue VCR game, but this is one of the few Laserdisc interactive game titles, and this is essentially the Laserdisc interactive Clue, just obviously not branded as such. We have the reflective Mystery Disc banner, and the cover has a little bit of gloss to it, which is nice. And again, we get the cast of characters on the back. Plus, the insert is here, which is also on glossy paper, but this includes the rules, the preparation, and nicely the background, the storyline, and then the map of the actual house, which has got to be helpful. So I've just always been curious about this as a big Clue fan, and I figured I might as well finally try it since, again, it was in one of Brian's whatnot sales for super, super cheap. So I've just always wanted to try this and figured I would see if anyone was ready for murder knowing that i'm a giant bond fan he sent me the spy maker made for tv film this is a 1990 film 1991 ld which is quite uncommon but this stars jason connery as ian fleming in a shall we say highly dramatized version of fleming's life uh, before writing james bond and the idea is that all of his life events fed into the novels which of course they did but it was certainly never as wonderfully over the top and silly in places as spy maker would have you believe so i've seen this before over the years but i've never thought i'd get to see it on ld which this jacket actually has a, a nice gloss finish on it and is in good shape and of course is from ryan's favorite label image entertainment the makers of vhs plus the back is extremely generic, and again, this is basically a TV movie that has been released video many times and is a real curiosity for Bond fans and definitely something you should see at least once uh, if you're a Bond fan just for the amusement value of 
it gets some of the history right, but then totally goes off the deep end in other areas. So it's it's charming in that way. Uh, but this does also have digital sound as well. So this, of course, is a must for me and my Bond adjacent titles shelf. Next, I also picked up The Broken Chain, simply because it's a film I've not gotten to see. It's one of the Turner-backed uh, 90s historical films, and of course, it stars Pierce Brosnan, and I have to see everything Pierce Brosnan is ever in for my Bond-adjacent shelf. Uh, it's a pretty nice jacket, has some nice gloss finish to it. It's a Turner release pressed by Image Entertainment and looks quite spiffy, does have digital PCM audio, but um, I'm not sure, I don't I don't know 100% for certain, but I think this might be one of the Turner television movies that was actually shot on film and made like a feature film with a bigger budget and bigger name stars, but didn't actually necessarily always get a theatrical release. But still, this looks quite impressive. It's always been on my watch list. I've just never gotten to see it. And it's not a super common LD, so I figured I would try it out. And then lastly, I picked up uh, two Japanese pressings that he had in one of his whatnot sales. Uh, nobody else was bidding on them and they were dirt cheap because the Broterian King will sell you Laserdisc for dirt cheap because he's got to make room for the next shipment from Indonesia. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, but both of these I picked up because they're not only Japanese pressings, they're in perfect shape, but they're also Japanese pressings of titles that are notorious U.S. rotters. So picked up the Japanese pressing of Unforgiven, which has a the original poster artwork, slightly different jacket because we just have black backgrounds on the sides. And we have the credits and the Oscar award actually printed on here. So it's basically the award style jacket. The rear is similar to other um, rear covers, but also in the Japanese style, so it's a bit more colorful. And then we also get a nice Japanese style black and white gatefold. So this has a more premium feel than the standard US pressing, which of course also suffers from laser rot, which this Japanese pressing doesn't. Otherwise, it seems to be the same overall source master as the US disc. It does have the original uh, Dolby Stereo encoded mix on the digital tracks as PCM, and of course is also widescreen. So this is basically the rot-free Japanese pressing of the US disc with a sturdier and fancier looking jacket. Uh, the same thing goes for this, uh, which is another Japanese release of a super notorious U.S. rotter, and that's Under Siege 2, which I've always been curious about seeing what this looked like on LD because Under Siege itself is a really great LD with a great sound mix. So this is the Japanese pressing without any rot issues, but also this adds Dolby Digital AC3, which is not on the U.S. disc. It's also got the ProLogic encoded Dolby Stereo PCM digital tracks, but of course the real draw here is not having any rot and actually getting AC3 as well. This doesn't pop up all that often like most Japanese imports, so I was surprised to see it pop up and it was so cheap I just couldn't say no, so I finally have a rot-free Under Siege 2 with the AC3 track. So thanks to Ryan for all those, and now I'll close out with all the discs that I picked up. To go through animation titles, I did finally get the Phantom 2040 compilation uh, or movie version of the first five or so episodes. This was a series I grew up on and adored and unfortunately has never had an official complete series release. And this predated Batman Beyond by a number of years. And quite frankly, Batman Beyond kind of repeated or lifted a lot of elements from this series. This is a really bold and imaginative reimagining of the first costume superhero, the ghost who walks himself, in the year 2040 in a extreme sci-fi dystopia, and of course came from the same animation minds behind Aeon Flux. So this definitely has that very distinctive style to it. It is very 90s, very cyberpunk, and very obviously Blade Runner influence, but also has an ecological theme and is far more adult than it should be because this is following in the wake of Batman the Animated Series, so it also has a phenomenal voice cast. This is a compilation of the first five episodes, which was also released on VHS, which is what I had growing up. So, of course, this also has digital PCM audio and the better quality of LD. You can get this movie version of the first episodes as a DVD, which I do recommend because this show is fantastic. But all you can get is this movie. Um, thankfully, people did record the show back in the day, and you can actually look at really crummy uh, transfers of those that are floating around online. So unfortunately, that's the only way you can see the entire series of this 
really, truly underrated uh, ahead of its time uh, animated series. I couldn't pass up a cheap copy of one of the Disney Tailspin volumes. This is like their uh, handful of other uh, releases on Laserdisc of various episodes from uh, their classic 90s cartoon series. So this is two episodes of Tailspin, plus of course having digital audio and a much spiffier printing than the standard VHS edition. So these are incredibly uncommon and usually cost quite a bit. And of course, for some of these episodes are the best presentations because they also have digital audio as opposed to the version that's on DVD. And uh, some, like the Darkwing Duck one, are actually the uncut pilot episode. But still, I don't expect to see Disney animated series just popping up. Amazingly, I was able to find the CAV reissue of The Little Mermaid with the 5.1 uh, remastered stereo track. This was done after the uh, 90s reissue of the film in theaters, and the new sound mix was done, the new transfer and everything, and then there was this uh, later release LD. This is the harder to find CLV version, and both versions, CAV and CLV, are rather uncommon. So this is one of the few Disney releases I still needed to find, and amazingly, I found it at one of the local stores in good shape. It does have a nice gatefold, although it's just images only. And then we have the chapter stops on the rear in the usual Disney style. This does have the THX seal of approval. It does have the remixed Dolby Stereo on the digital tracks, but then also the uh, AC3 5.1 of this remix track. So uh, you do get the best technical presentation of the film on Laserdisc. And you do actually get some extras, which include uh, the original trailer, a making of documentary, and some other featurettes of character design and concept art. So... This is technically a special edition and definitely the spiffiest version on Laserdisc. And it's a later disc, so of course that's why it rarely pops up, and especially not the CAV version. So this is just one of the few Disney discs I had left on my uh, to-pick-up list. So now I'm just one closer to uh, Disney completion. And now for the standard disc to go through by director at first, I picked this up because it's a nice-looking disc. I've never actually gotten to see this film, and it was less than a dollar, so... I picked up Kansas City, which is a Robert Altman film from the 90s. It's got a really nice thick gloss on the jacket, obviously sized for VHS dimensions. But this is an image pressing that actually also includes Dolby Digital AC3 5.1. So I'm a sucker for cheap AC3 discs as well. So again, I've always wanted to see this, just never gotten around to it. And it's a pretty nice looking LD pressing. And it's getting later on in LD because it's a 1996 film, 1997 pressing with AC3 for less than a dollar. So you can find interesting films like this with really great later LD pressings, even with AC3 for less than a dollar. I picked up the Richard Brooks picture, Bite the Bullet, which I do have on DVD, but this is the spiffier Sony widescreen LD with nice custom artwork and a nice write-up on the rear. This is just film only, but we get the usual nicer Sony write-up because these are actual quotes from Brooks himself, and I've been wanting to revisit this. This does have digital audio, so it should be the original Bondo Mix's PCM. Um, I don't think this has any rot issues either, but of course, being Sony, you always have to worry about that stuff, but I just always wanted to see this again, and I figured I would try the LD pressing, and it was also super cheap. This one was also rather cheap, and this is such a rare title, that I've always wanted to see the, the actual transfer of and hear the audio of. I picked it up even though it's you know, an X rental and not the sort of condition I would normally pick up something in, but it's the final 1998 late release custom pressing of Gone with the Wind. So, and it was only $3. So. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. So obviously this is X rental. I was able to work off most of the stickers, but uh, there is of course some damage and wear and it already had some of the laminate peeling off, unfortunately. Of course, this is multiple discs and a single jacket because this is late period Warner, really thin cardstock. So if you find this, it's gonna have ring wear, it's gonna have damage and creasing and everything. So this is actually in pretty good shape. But of course, it's X rentals. You got rental stickers, which also are on the back. This has a really nice looking rear cover. But the real draw here is, of course, this was a new transfer. This is supposed to have specific color timing for this release. And most importantly, the film did get a theatrical reissue at this time with a brand new custom 5.1 remix, which, as far as anyone knows, was only released on this laser disc in the form of the AC3 track on here. Uh, the later remixes were done from scratch, so 
This is a particular theatrical remix that was done for the 90s reissue and only turned up here. And you've also got you know, what should be the technical best presentation of the actual picture transfer in terms of seeing the film represented on Laserdisc in something closer to approximating its original three-strip Technicolor glory. So I've just always wanted to see this for the, you know, the digital soundtrack on here, that 5.1 mix, and to see how they handled the transfer um, compared to the old CAV box set version. But it's so late in Laserdisc and so rare and usually so expensive that I've just never gotten a copy, so I couldn't pass up even this dinged up X rental copy for $3. So uh, I just picked this up to finally look at this transfer, look, listen to the audio, and just see what the final laser disc pressing of the film was like. Similarly, I also found a super cheap copy that was actually sealed of the AC3 reissue of Dr. Zhivago. This is the reissue of the big MGM box set, uh, but of course this did add Dolby Digital AC3 and even still has the sticker on here because this copy is still sealed. I also think this has the best rendering of the art. It's the poster key art, which is just stunning on the white background. And of course this would get reused for the special edition DVD. So this is still the artwork I think of for the film. And I always wanted to pick this up just for the jacket. Um, again, the box set will have technically the better picture, but again, I think the CLV reissue has the better cover. And of course, this is the version that adds AC3 5.1. The rear looks pretty nice, but it's also rather similar to previous releases. Pieces. Again, this is the same transfer from the box set, just a later 1997 pressing and a reissue with AC3. But at least we did get a nice gatefold, and I've just always wanted to pick this up just because I love this image, and I always wanted to see what this looked like compared to the box set. I also picked up the Joseph Mankiewicz film, There Was a Crooked Man. Again, this is X rental, and I haven't been able to get the stickers off yet, but otherwise it's in perfect shape, and again, it was just a few cents, so I can't pass up even a solid letterbox Warner pressing for just a few cents. Uh, this does have digital audio, should be the original mono mix. And on top of that, like Warner would do, Side 3 is indeed in CAV. So this is a Warner letterbox title, and they at least put the widescreen indicator there on the rear to let you know this is actually widescreen. But I've just always meant to see this film again, and this was a super cheap copy in pretty good shape. The only real issue is there is some wear because it's not a gatefold, and we do have the X rental stickers on here. I also found the reissue of Jeremiah Johnson that uh, Sidney Pollitt directed with Robert Redford. Uh, what's interesting about this, it's got the custom art. The rear is the traditional Warner style, uh, but there's no indication this is actually a newer transfer, and it has digital audio, so go figure. So this is a much spiffier disc than you would think, and it's definitely the version you don't see a lot. So if you want the best version of the film on Laserdisc, this is the version you need to find. And after this point, all the other versions just have audio remixes pretty much. So this is still probably the best source of the film's original mono mix. Next for Don Siegel, I picked up the Republic reissue of Invasion of the Body Snatchers with the very strikingly 1950s color inspired artwork. Uh, I've just always been curious about this disc for the transfer this does have digital audio. It is widescreen, but of course you lose the extra and commentary from the Criterion release. But sometimes Republic discs have better AV specs than older Criterion discs, and the jacket is really nice. And I've always been a gigantic nerd about this film because it is one of the great science fiction films of all time. And so this was just one of the pressings I'd never gotten to look at, and I finally found a nice condition, inexpensive, cheap copy. Next is 1952's Blackbeard the Pirate, which was directed by Raoul Walsh, as and it's here as part of the RKO Classic Collection. I've never gotten to see this, so I figured it would be a good way to finally correct that, and it moves me one step closer to RKO disc completion, and of course has a nice digital soundtrack. So this is the best pressing of the film on LD, and part of the lovely RKO Classic Collection. And then to move on to the last couple of extra discs I picked up, I finally got the letterbox copy of Deliverance, which has a really nice thick gloss on the jacket, and this is in pretty good shape. This is definitely the best pressing on LD and it's the only widescreen version. It does have digital audio which has been Dolby Surround encoded and I believe it's a remix as pretty much all releases of this film are. I think trying to find the original mono mix is easier said than done. 
Um, at least I think this is a remix. I don't think it was originally in stereo, but I've never known for sure. Um, I just always meant to pick this up if I found a cheap copy, and I finally found this minty one with a really nice glossy jacket. So this is definitely the version you want to track down on LD. I also picked up the standard pressing of Continental Divide, which also is known as the film that got uh, Lawrence Kasdan noticed and got him the job working on Empire Strikes Back and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, this is a really charming film that I haven't seen in ages. It finally does have a newer release, but I couldn't pass up the minty laser disc for super cheap. This does also have digital audio, so it should be the original audio mix as PCM. As you can see, this was obviously sized for VHS, and then they just said, oh, we need an image over here, but it's kind of faded into the background. So that's definitely the sign they sized this for VHS. Um, the only issue here is it's not in a widescreen aspect ratio, so it's not original aspect ratio. So I'm guessing this is a sort of open mat or opened up transfer. I don't think this was originally scoped, so I'm pretty sure this is opened up. But still, you know, at least it has digital audio and a nice looking jacket. And it's not a super common LD either, so I figured I might as well pick it up because I know I'll pick up the new release I've wanted to get and I'll at least be able to compare the audio tracks. And now I'll close out with three uh, particular pressings of very common titles that are also super rotters. And all three of these pressings are very difficult to come by. Uh, this first one I didn't even know really existed until I started looking for it and then I could never find one. And then lo and behold, I did actually manage to find a rot-free pressing of Desperado. Uh, Desperado is, of course, a notorious Laserdisc Rot title. It's also a Sony Columbia title pressed at DADC USA. However, this is one of the hard-to-find DADC Austria pressings, so they do exist for this film, and this is indeed Rot-free. Of course, you do have to look at the disc labels to see that it's an Austrian copy, but this has the same jacket, of course. It's got Actually, a nicer finish than usually the copies I see, but most copies you see of this film are beat to crap, and probably people saw that their discs were rotted and they took out their frustrations on their copies before getting rid of them. But there are DADC Austria rot-free copies of Desperado out there, so this is, of course, the version you have to track down. The next one is another DADC Austria pressing of a very common title that does have a good rot percentage, though not as high as Desperado, and that's The Quick and the Dead, uh, which I left the price stickers on because I picked this up for 99 cents. So these things are out there, but you do have to actually know what you're looking for and slip the disc out and look at the mint marks to see those beautiful words manufactured by DADC Austria. That's how you know you have a rot-free pressing. Otherwise, this is a standard Sony jacket. Looks quite nice. The rear has their usual write-up, uh, but of course, this does not have AC3. It's just Dolby Surround PCM because Sony, like some studios, would cheap out on AC3. So that's what you lose here, but otherwise, this is how you find the rot-free version of the film. And as with all DADC Austria pressings, these are much harder to come by than you'd think, although it's probably easier to find this one than it is Desperado. And then last but certainly not least, this is a title that the standard pressing is a horrible rotter, and the copies I've gone through have been some of the worst rot-affected discs I've ever seen, and in fact had sections that were completely unplayable. So lo and behold, I managed to find the Fugitive, but in the all-important anamorphic widescreen squeeze version that was only designed to be sold with Toshiba televisions at the time as a promotional piece. This is one of the handful of Warner titles that had this happen, and thankfully some of these were uh, for titles like The Fugitive here, which is a notorious rotter on the standard pressing. This, of course, has a much thinner jacket, and this copy was sealed, so as you could see, it has a ton of corner creasing and ring wear because it's not a gatefold, and the cardstock's even thinner than the standard version. But also, where the standard version doesn't have this, this has a really thick gloss finish on it, so that's another way to tell. But I just couldn't believe I finally found this, and of course, the way to know is here on the rear, there's the little blurb about the Toshiba televisions and that this is actually 16.9. So 
this is how you differentiate these and otherwise it's identical to the rear and i can't tell you how many times i looked at copies of the fugitive just looking for this all important bar here on the back so this is the box you want to look for this is the box that's on the copies of unforgiven uh, grumpy old men or free willy and of course the fugitive i think it's i think it's just those four actually um but again the fugitive is a terrible rotter on standard pressing this is incredibly rare so I picked it up immediately as soon as I found it. And it's just really astonishing to look at squeeze anamorphic presentation attempts on Laserdisc as opposed to DVD down the road. So this is, of course, where anamorphic started on home video and really only took off in Japan. It's very rare that it was used on US discs, and that's why these were promotional discs for early Toshiba 16x9 televisions. Otherwise, it's the same overall master as the standard pressing. It has the same beautiful original Dolby Stereo mix on the digital tracks. This has a brilliant sound mix in terms of design for the era. And the standard pressing would be a great laser disc if it wasn't for the rot issues. So the actual master and audio was good. And the audio, in fact, was exceptionally good for the time. So you get that here in the better squeeze presentation without any rot problems. The trouble is these are stupidly rare and hard to find and you'll be like me and you just randomly stumble across one and about pass out in the store. So that closes out this section of my Laserdisc pickups. These are all the other discs I've picked up over the rest of the year and some discs from other Wolfpack members. So as always, I hope my babblings about the wonderful fun of collecting and spinning Laserdisc has been at least somewhat fun and informative. Uh, hopefully you're able to find some nice Laserdisc finds in your local area. You never know when things randomly pop up almost all of this uh, just randomly happened to pop up in some of my local haunts so every once in a while there seems to be a, a big turnover and then big lots come in and then suddenly it's Christmas morning for Laserdisc. So as always, please do keep uh, supporting your local stores to help keep them in business. Uh, keep enjoying the Laserdisc format. Keep your disc spinning. Keep your players going. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.